This video is about this unusual little power supply. It's similar to one I showed in a recent video, but unlike the other one that was optimised for high voltage, this is a Royer oscillator, but it's optimised for low voltage. I've never seen one used in quite this way before. Because it's been used with an odd lamp that I featured in a previous video. It's a germicidal lamp, and it has a tungsten filament inside it. And once it's heated up to a certain temperature inside, it then initiates a mercury vapour discharge glow. But all this happens at low voltage. And to see how this is controlled, because it has to be current limited by, well, this power supply. I've got the oscilloscope here, a little tiny little oscilloscope, which will zoom in a little bit and we shall watch the waveform as this lamp lights up. I won't leave the lamp lit too long because it's not good for me to look at. So you'll see this glow and then you'll see it light up. You'll see the waveform initially start quite high until the arc is initiated and then the voltage will drop down. Are you ready? Starting now. Sound wave peaks, drops down, I'm just going to freeze it and then I'm going to turn that back off again so I don't expose myself to lots of UVC. So initially the voltage peaked at probably close to about 40 volts. After that it settled down to a peak to peak voltage of about 20 volts but with a sort of average value closer to the 10 volts this is designed for. In fact that's, all, that's very triangular that waveform. The frequency is 29.3 kilohertz. Um, let's take a closer look at this circuit board now. One moment, please. So here's the circuit board. This is the component side. It's a single-sided board. And what we have is the an input protect, polarity protection diode, which then goes to an inductor and then feeds the rest of the circuitry. We've got the two transistors, which basically push-pull a primary of this transformer. And there's two feedback resistors, and then there's a capacitor across the primary winding. Never quite worked out why that is. I think it might just be forming a sort of resonant circuit. The output in the transformer goes via a capa this capacitor here. It's a very, very simple circuit. Most of the work is effectively done in this transformer with the multiple windings. Let me show you the back of the circuit board, which I have flipped so that everything correlates. So that is more or less it. There's a lamp output. There's that series capacitor, the secondary winding the feedback and primary windings and, well, the other components. Let's take a look at the actual schematic. And you'll probably get deja vu. It's a slightly different way I've drawn it this time. There's the incoming positive supply, plus 12 volts. And there is the negative supply. I'll just write negative. Or it could be zero volts. It goes via this diode, which I think is a 1N4007. It's a, just a standard value. And it goes via that inductor there. The inductor is one micro, 100 micro Henry, and it has a resistance of one ohm. The resistance is purely the actual resistance of the wire that's used in winding that inductor. Uh, if you were passing a lot more current and you needed a 100 micro Henry inductor, you'd have to go up for a thicker wire. The resistance would go down, but you'd actually end up having to wind a much bigger inductor to get the same 100 micro Henrys. It's all a balance of how much current you need for a specific inductance. But that uh, inductor there then feeds the centre of the primary winding. I've written primary across here in a rather ugly way. Uh, but that uh, feeds that positive tap, almost treating it like two counterwound sort of windings. And there's two transistors, which are D882P. They are notable for feeding fairly high power transistors, but they've got very significantly what they call a low saturation voltage, which means that when they turn on the voltage dropped across them, uh, is much lower than a generic transistor. It just means there's less heat dissipation from them. I do remember when I was making high frequency, high voltage power supplies when I was younger, that the lower the collector emitter saturation voltage uh, you could get, the less likely the resistors were to smoke, basically. The After the inductor, it then goes to the base of the transistors via these uh, bias resistors, 2K2, red, 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 222, 2, 2, and 2, zeros, 2,200, 2K2. And then there's the feedback winding that alternately, as each winding is energised, each transistor not just turns the other transistor off, but drives itself on via the feedback from powering its section of the primary. So it's a very hard push-pull effect it gives. And whichever transistor starts first, in this case they've actually used the two resistors, sometimes they just omit one of them, 
But whichever of these starts first, uh, it's it, initially when you power it up, both transistors will start turning on, but one will have the edge, and the one that has the edge will actually determine, it, as soon as it starts turning on, it actually effectively fights the other one, turns the other one off, and that's what starts the sort of push-pull. The secondary, secondary, is normally high voltage in these things. I mean, it's not always high voltage, but it quite often is. And it's limited by this capacitor. Now, this is effectively, the output is AC. And this is what makes the Royer circuit special. It converts the DC to AC at fairly high frequency. And because it's high frequency, it means that this output capacitor that limits the current by amount, varying the amount of current that can flow in each half of the waveform, it effectively can be very, very small. A good example of that, I was looking at the Royer oscillator recently, and it's this tiny little capacitor here. Uh, am I even going to be able to read that? It's very, very tiny. I'm going to get the super duper mag magnifying glass for this one. You guys can probably read it with your high-definition televisions. Oh, I'm not even able to read it because I, I think it's 20 picofarad. Could be wrong. Yeah, it looks like it. It's not very clear. It's tiny and it's a bit grubby. But uh, even a tiny value, in this case, uh, what is the value of this one? Uh, 333, 33 nanofarad. Let me just write that in. 33 nanofarad. And because this is actually operating at, say, about 30 kilohertz, kilohertz, that allows quite a lot of power through that lamp. So this lamp, the, I've made a separate video about these. It's very odd. It's very retro. It's kind of, it should have been going out of fashion. But thanks to COVID and the sudden demand for germicidal lamps and things like that, it's come back. But this used to be used in things like tumble dryers and sanitation units because you get a couple of versions. Um, they both emit ultraviolet. However, the glass is a diff different fact from what actually comes out. They've got a heating element in them. That's the, the filament in here that uh, I'll show you. You know what? I'm going to show you this lighting up right now, right? Give me one moment, please. So as you saw when it lit up, there. It initially glowed at the end, and then once it had glowed, the, the, you saw the sort of the mercury vapour sort of take over. And it's really odd. It only operates typically at, at an average of about 10 volts. But it has this little heating element inside that has a what they call a thermi therm thermionic coating. It's a sort of therm thermally emissive. And if you look at the filament here, you can see the top is coated with white stuff, and that's the stuff they use in the end of fluorescent tubes. And what happens is that when this heats up, it starts emitting electrons. That lowers the voltage drop you'd normally have, because in a traditional cold cathode like a neon tube, you'd have quite a high voltage drop across these electrodes. So it lowers that down by basically emitting the electrons itself with that ther thermally emissive material. And that then allows it to conduct through the mercury vapour in here, which is most likely trapped on that metal plate. That could have been what's called a getter for cleaning, but it could also be a mercury amalgam, which stores the mercury until it's heated up and then releases it. It's just used for ease of dosing and simplicity of dosing during manufacture. But the glass that this is made of is uveol glass, sometimes called synthetic quartz. And there's two versions of these lamps available on eBay, and it doesn't matter which one you order because you'll get a random one. I've just been there too many times. I kept trying to order the ones that emitted ozone, I, you know, the ones that emit the wavelength that causes ozone, and uh, I kept getting ones that didn't. But here's the, the idea. The glass can either be very pure or can be doped with impurities. If it's doped with impurities, it will emit 253.7 or 254 nanometers, uh, which is standard UVC. It's the germicidal wavelength. But if it's very pure, it can also emit 184.5 nanometer, which is a very short wave UVC. And that can actually break apart the oxygen there. And that's what creates the ozone. And these things used to be used in things like laundry equipment, like tumble drawers, just to actually keep them fresh and hygienic inside and also sort of sterilise the clothing, I guess. But in the case of the laundry equipment, they were quite often just a big, say, a common in America, so right, 120 volts in, transformer, 24 volts out, and then just a big resistor in series of the lamp, and it just re relied on that uh, 
resistor acting as a sort of ballast and allowing the heater to heat up and then limiting the current through the mercury vapor. Other ways they can drive these, I've heard people say that you can use these little drivers to drive them. I've never tried this. These are LED drivers that have an open circuit voltage that flies up to above 12 volts, but they limit the current to 300 milliamps. But the downside of these is, because of the emission from mercury vapor, it always happens in the negative electrode. In the case of these ones, you probably saw when it glowed there that it was glowing at both ends. If you run it in DC, it will just glow at one end because the, all the activity happens at the cathode. But there we go. That is that power supply. I've never seen it used like in a style like this before in such a low voltage, but it does make sense. Uh, and it is the exact the same types used for the high voltage cold cathode type uh, lamps that are, well, neon, in small neon power supplies. But that was interesting. Very neat. It did come in a case. It came in a case, glued down at the corners, and they'd obviously fed the cables, uh, put the circuit board in, fed the cables through, and then crimped them into connectors on the outside, because to get it out, I had to actually cut the connectors off before I could get the circuit board out. But that's it. Model DC12, use 3 watt, ballast lamp. Uh, and the lamp itself is called a GTL3. Goes under other names. Very strange lamp. It has made a bit of a, a comeback this year along with other things like that. But there we go. That's interesting. As I say, I've never seen one of these used in this particular style before, in a, a low voltage lamp, but then it is a very specialist current limited supply that needs. And a sort of it also needs that voltage to go up high enough to basically cause it to strike over before it actually starts glowing. But very neat, very interesting little circuit.